Oh, thank you, Stephen and Daryl. We're so glad to be here today. Welcome to Sacred Journey at Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're so glad that you're with us this morning, whether you're online or whether you're here in the room. What a wonderful day it is to be in the presence of God and one another as the community of faith gathers. Just take a moment, close your eyes for a second, put yourself in a really comfortable place, and let's just breathe in slowly so we can breathe in the breath of God. And then let's slowly release that breath and allow all of the cares of the world and the things that we are burdened with today, let's let that go for just an hour now to just open ourselves up to the great creator who has created the birds, the streams, the clouds, the beauty of creation. Let us take it all in and give thanks to God as we gather in God's spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, move among us and fill us. Come, Creator God, and remind us that you are always creating new. Come, Christ, be among us and remind us of how you loved and how you love through us now. Morning has broken. Let's stand. We cannot sing it today out loud in this room, but please hum along and sing it in your hearts. And if you're at home, sing out loud.
Oh, it's pre-recorded. I didn't see it was pre-recorded. Okay. Steadfast and faithful God, we do not fear this day, for you are with me. Wherever we might go, your light to shine ahead, your footsteps to lead the way, we do not fear this day. For your word will be our guide, your strength will sustain us, your love revive us, this day and all days. We do not fear this day, for you are with us. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, 
and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Seshem. There he set up camp beside the Oak of Morah. At that time, the area era was inhabited by Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give you this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, Abram traveled south and set up camp in the hill country with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built another altar and dedicated it to the Lord. He worshiped the Lord. Then Abram continued traveling south by stages toward Negev. Reflecting on this text, I chose a musical piece uh, called Prayer for the Water Protectors. And I chose that to think about the idea of God giving the land to man, not for us to use as we please, but to be caretakers of the land. And so that's why I chose this piece, Prayer for the Water Protectors. And in the piece, I play an instrument called the kora. Uh, which is a West African harp uh, made out of a big gourd, an animal hide, and wood and strings. So while you listen to it, I uh, invite you to reflect on that idea, us to be caretakers of the land. in for a treat this morning because we have a special guest to give us the story today. Stephen Hill is an ordained United Methodist minister who pastored several congregations in northern Indiana for 10 years before leaving parish ministry for law school in the mid-1990s. They have since enjoyed a nearly 25-year career as a lawyer in private practice, both in a large firm, a law firm, as a solo practitioner and as a solo practitioner. 
In addition to their focus on commercial real estate transactions, they have also found their services to be helpful in a number, number of local churches needing legal assistance over the years, given their experience in how both the law and the church work. In less than a month, Stefan and their spouse, Margot, will finish emptying out their downtown condo and move into their motor home and set out across the country as wandering nomads like Abraham and Sarai. And so how appropriate it is that we preach on that text today. I want you to welcome with me now Reverend Stephen Hill. Thank you. Uh, I anticipated that most people would not know that about me, but as I look out, it turns out that very many of the people here this morning know that I'm planning in about four weeks to close that front door and lock it, hopefully for the last time, and climb into the motorhome and take off. And I know the question will come up, so I'll answer it now. No, I did not watch the movie Nomadland. <laughs> or it's probably more accurate to say I watched about 10 minutes of it, and then I thought, you know, this is going to be depressing. <laughs> I don't like and turned it off. But it's been 26 and a half years now since Margot and I and her son, who is now our son, drove a rental truck from Nashville to Minneapolis. And now with John, long ago, married and moved away, he celebrated his 10th anniversary this weekend. It doesn't seem possible. Margot and I have this dream to move into a 32-foot motorhome and take off down the road. And this goal, as you can imagine, emptying out you know, all those years of our lives, including the stuff we moved from our last home into our condo that we never even unpacked, <laughs> has caused me to really resonate with this passage. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, Judy can, tell you, can attest to this, I actually, as I'd been pondering it, said, did you pick this Sunday for me to preach because of the text? And I don't know, she swears that it just happened to be the way the calendar worked out. Yahweh told Abram, it's time for you to get up and go. Time to move. Leave the place you are. Leave your extended family, your father's people, and go to a place I'm going to show you. And then there's this lovely poetic interlude. It says, I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you will be cursed, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, it seems like this passage comes out of nowhere, and suddenly we're introduced to Abram, who will be a central character, not only in Genesis, but for the rest of the Bible. But for a moment, let me give you just some context that this isn't actually the first time we hear about Abram. I know most of us kind of skip over kind of everything that happened between Noah and the Great Flood and chapter 12 where God tells Abram to get up. And, you know, maybe we vaguely remember there was some really old guy whose name we don't remember, it was Methuselah. And there was something about a Tower of Babel and people speaking other languages. But 
At the end of chapter 11, there's a long section of what a lot of people call the begatitudes, you know, so-and-so had a son named X, and, and then it sometimes says, and there were other sons and daughters too, but you know, they're not important to the story, so meh, they don't have names. And then we come down to a man named Tara, and suddenly Tara has sons who are important. He has three sons. Abram, Nacor, and Haran. And all three of the sons have names. And one of them we never hear about again, except the names of his sons. And Haran is important only because he had a son named Lot, and then he died. And it says he died while his father was still alive, which I guess was as rare then as it is today. Remember that Genesis is a story of beginnings. It's an origin story. You know, uh, think of we as Americans have these origin stories about who we are as a people, and we, we tell the story of the pilgrims and the first Thanksgiving, and, and we know that a lot of them are, his, let's just say they weren't entirely historically accurate. You know, the story of George Washington, oh, I cannot tell a lie, it was I who chopped down the cherry tree. And if we think of other origin stories, even right here in this area, the Lakota have an origin story about how the Great Spirit was so distressed at how corrupt and evil people were that he cried a flood. It's a really interesting story. He cried a flood that wiped out all the people and almost all the animals, and then he repopulated the new earth with new people and new animals. And the Anishinaabe, uh, among other peoples, including people in India and people in China, have an origin story that the earth travels about on the back of a giant turtle. And I think that this is the way that we should read the early passages. I'd say the first 12 chapters, the first 11 chapters of Genesis. It's our origin story. It's how we understand who we are as a people, how we as people relate to the creator, how we relate to the physical and cultural environment around us. That's what an origin story does for us. Anyway, uh, to bring us then from chapter 11 where we meet Tara and Abram and Nahorn and Haran and Lot who becomes part of Abram's household after his father Haran dies. We read that Tara took all of these people and he set out from where he was, you may have heard of Ur of the Chaldeans before. So that was Abram's father. And it says that he set out toward Canaan. But he got to a place called Haran. And it's all confusing. I had to make myself a little cheat sheet. In fact, I had to look up the difference between Haran the person and Haran the place. Anyway, Haran is a city in Turkey, just to give you some context. And they got there and instead of continuing on their voyage to Canaan, they stopped there and they stayed there presumably for many years. And we understand from chapter 12 that during the time that they were there, Abram accumulated many possessions. He accumulated a wife, Sarai, whom we'll meet later more in later 
uh, chapters. He, accumul he took Lot, his nephew, into his family. He had servants and cattle and camels, and I don't know what all, all he had. But they just stopped, and that's where they stayed. And then we come to chapter 12, where God, or Yahweh, as he's called by this writer, and, and the hint is that when you read in the Bible, it says, the Lord, and it says, Lord, in all capital letters. That's the, the word Yahweh, instead of the word Elohim for God. So the Lord says to Abram, it's time to leave. Get up and continue that trip that you and your father started many years ago. Set out, and, and we read that he was 75 when he set out from Haran. And he took his wife, Sarai, he took his nephew, Lot, all their possessions, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. It's always curious this week. I mean, how far are we talking? So I Googled it, and both Haran and Shechem still exist today, so Google tells me it's over 500 miles from Haran to Shechem. Whoa, 540 miles. Say you walk from here to Chicago and then you keep going till you hit Fort Wayne, Indiana. On foot or they may have had carts of some kind, I don't really know for sure. It was about 2000 BC, so we're talking Bronze Age, I guess. They might have had some carts, but it still sounds like a really daunting journey to me. I, I know one thing, I know they didn't have planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> and then I looked at a map, and there are mountains. So now it's beginning to sound to me a little bit like getting on a wagon and traveling the Oregon Trail. And I don't know how many of you have played that game, but what I remember of playing the Oregon Trail is that mostly everyone died. <laughs> Long before they reached Oregon. <laughs> so Abram had to travel 500 miles. He had to go across mountains and rivers and wilderness. He had to feed this whole household while they traveled. And it's not unoccupied territory. If you were listening while David read, it said that the land was inhabited by the Canaanites at the time. But God promised something to Abram. He promised Abram that his, sorry, I keep slipping and saying Abraham, but that's, that's a few chapters down the road. We're still calling him Abram at this point. He promised Abram that his descendants would possess the land, and they would be a great nation, and would bring blessing to all of the world through him. And so in the face of all these obstacles, Abram chose to believe God and to do the thing that God told him to do. Move to a place you've never known, God said. Cross the mountains with everything you own and everyone who's part of your household. You're going to have to go up and down mountains. You're going to have to find food and face obstacles. But in the end, God said, good will come of it. A blessing will come of it. Now, you won't see it. Oh, you'll see, you know, you'll see your children. You'll see your children's children. But you won't live to see Isaac's 12 sons. You will not live to see them exist through 400 years of enslavement. You won't exist to see those people free themselves from enslavement and come back here and fight to take over this land. 
but go. Go and take your family to a place hundreds of miles away, to a place I have in store for you. And what did Abram do? He answered the call. So let me ask you today, what has God called you to do? What is your calling? You know, we, we tend to pigeonhole that word calling to someone who's called to the ministry, someone who's called to work uh, perhaps overseas for the church, or for someone who's otherwise devoting their lives to the church as a career. When I was working through the process and all the boards and committees and retreats and meetings and papers to be ordained as an elder in the United Methodist Church, one of the requirements was to describe your call. You know, that wasn't just me. Judy had to go through that. Uh, Jim McChesney had to do that. Kathy, Molly, anyone becoming a minister has to describe their call. It's just part of that discernment process. But that isn't the story I want to share with you today. Because I also had a calling to leave the ministry. I'd been in parish ministry for 10 years, and I was doing well, and everyone kept saying, oh, you know, you're going to become a bishop, you're going to become a district superintendent. I got to tell you, becoming a bishop never had any appeal to me. <laughs> but the point was, it was clear that I was on the path to advancement, so to speak. But it started to feel to me like Shoes that have worn out. Shoes that just don't fit comfortably any longer. And I knew that God wanted something different for me. Now, most of you know that I'm a proud member of the LGBTQ tribe. And at the risk of offending some of you, I refer to myself using the word queer, the Q of LGBTQ, because it just feels like it fits best for me. At any rate, I spent 10 years trying to walk that line that the Book of Discipline lays out for me, which basically left me one option to be celibate for the rest of my life, to be in ministry. Of keeping who I am bottled up and stuffed away in the back of the closet, which I suppose would have perhaps driven me from ministry all by itself eventually. But God laid on me another burden. And that was to live a full life in a setting in which I could be fully myself, could have relationships, could have a loving family, and continue to demonstrate the love and grace of God, this time as a queer adult role model. You see, I don't know if you know this, but LGBTQ youth are at least three times as likely to attempt or complete acts of suicide as their straight peers. A national survey taken just last year found that 40% of LGBTQ young people teens and young adults had considered suicide within the previous 12 months. And for transgender and non-binary LGBT youth, that number climbs to more than 50%. 
Back in the mid-90s, when I was going through this transition to leave the ministry to me, we didn't have, it was harder to measure who's queer, who's gay, as we mostly called it then, who's LGBTQ, but there, the studies we had suggested that it might be seven to eight times as likely to attempt or complete suicide as their peers. And I hope, no, I pray that that breaks your heart. I can tell you that it broke mine. And it felt like these were my own family, that these were the children of my people who had no hope. And God told me that they needed me more than the church did. Sometimes that's what calling looks like. Sometimes it might be the impression that God wants you to volunteer for service with Dignity Center, with a homeless shelter, with tutoring, with the anti-racism work that our church is endeavoring to accomplish. Sometimes it might mean learning to forgive someone or learning to ask for forgiveness. Or maybe it means choosing, finding a cause that you believe in and door knocking for it, phone calling for it, raising money, uh, volunteering with setting up an after school program for parents holding down I mean, for the children of parents holding down multiple jobs who cannot find affordable child care. Maybe you know that you are meant to do something hard, something that's outside of your comfort zone. But mostly what you see is mountains. Friends, today's scripture invites us to listen to God's calling to move outside of that comfort zone. To pack up whatever you need for the journey and follow that calling wherever God leads you. And I believe that God's promise to Abram is intended for all of you who take that step. Whether you work up the courage and the obedience to do it today or this week or next month. The promise that you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. In the name of God the Creator, God the Redeemer, God the lover. Amen. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Stefan. We have been blessed. And so let us bless one another as we share the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to stand and bless one another as we prepare for a time of prayer.
It is good to be together and to reconnect with our spirits and our elbows. And if you're at home this morning, we're hoping that you connected and shared the peace of Christ with those who you're worshiping with today in your own household, wherever that is. We're glad you're with us. We come to a time of prayer now. And in the Sacred Journey community, we share our prayer concerns. And so if you have a prayer concern on your online, please make sure that you put that in the chat. We have someone is watching and will bring those prayer concerns to us this morning so we can include them in the community prayer. If you have a prayer concern, just raise your hand and I'll come with the mic. You can share that joy or concern and then we'll take that prayer into our hearts and then release it to the Holy Spirit into the world as we share that with the community beyond these walls. Does anybody have a prayer concern this morning that you would like to share with this community? I'd ask for prayers for my friend Steve, whose brother passed away Tuesday. Uh, peace be for him. We take that prayer into our hearts. And let that sit there just for a moment or two. And then we release that to God and to the world. I'd like prayers for my Aunt Joyce, who's 95 and starting to fail, and I'd like prayers that I find a way to get out to visit her before she passes. prayers for a dear friend who is currently struggling with an employment slash unemployment situation. ask for prayers for myself as I continue to feel the heaviness and sadness of the loss of my husband um, in May and also for my mother who lost her husband and my father in December. And I ask for prayers for my my trans daughter, that she stay positive. I offer prayers for all who are LGBTQ and their families, allies. We pray for everyone who feels that they are not included. And we pray that the church and all places will open our hearts so that we might all be loved and cared for and to hear our calling. This morning we have brothers and sisters who are suffering in Haiti after an enormous earthquake. And we know that that country has been unstable for many years and also after their president has been assassinated, we know that there's just a great amount of turmoil there. We have United Methodists who are on the ground there, who are working with the people, who are providing food and comfort and encouragement. And this morning, before you go, I invite you to uh, either click on, on your phone and to give to a special Haiti offering or to place a check into the heart-shaped bowl. We want to be in solidarity with our brothers and sisters and siblings in Haiti as they suffer, as we can be hope to them as we offer resources in our prayers this morning. And of course, we also know that we need to pray for the country of Afghanistan. We have been there as Americans protecting and serving and there have been so many over the last 20 years who have been in that place so far away 
And now as they come out and as the people are suffering there, as the Taliban takes over, we pray for safety. We pray for order in the midst of chaos. And we just pray that God's hand will be there to provide what is needed. Let us pray. This week, we will have another listening and learning time for this Sacred Journey community. It will be Thursday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And, and my prayer is that we would seek God's leading, whatever that may be, that we might listen carefully to one another with open hearts, with loving hearts, with openness to whatever God would lead us to do next. Let us pray. God of Abram and Sarai, God of all of us who think as we are too old or too poor or too small or too weak or too busy. God of all of us daunted by the sheer wonder of the plan you lay out before us. We come to you now aware of all you have done for us and yet struggling with our doubts Birth us anew, O oh God. Hear us and help us on our sacred journey. God of Abram and Sarai, we pray for this world where so many wander hopeless. Homeless, not by choice, but out of necessity. Where so many are looking for milk and honey or a great name to rescue them. We pray for all the people of this world, especially Afghanistan. We pray for the women and men who lay down their lives for the safety of siblings and neighbors. We pray for those who lead us. Birth us anew, O God. Hear us and help us on our sacred journey. God of Abram and Sarai, we pray for all those who long for a new beginning, those who are imprisoned, those who are estranged, those who are left loved ones behind, and for those who are ill or infirm, especially those on our prayer list. Give them all new life by the power of your spirit. Help us to see how we can be present with them as your hands and feet. Birth us anew, O God. Hear us and help us on our sacred journey. God of Abram and Sarai, we pray for your holy church. Give us the courage to leave everything behind and follow you. Give us the faith to act on what we do not understand. Bless us to be blessing to everyone in your name. Birth us all anew, O God. Hear us and help us on our sacred journey. There's a tradition in this Sacred Journey community to have a special prayer and blessing time for particular good news in people's lives. So we invite you to come up and share any, anything happening in your life or the life of your loved ones that you want to celebrate and have the community bless you. Feel free to come up to the mic.
to remind you that we have a wonderful new thing happening, and that is that we have a new associate pastor who will be starting on September 1st, and her name is Laura Hanna, and we're very excited about her coming. I want to celebrate my continued blessings of seeing beautiful creatures out near where I live. I saw a beautiful black bear up close uh, last week, as well as a fox, some turkeys, hummingbirds, things like that. So I'm going to celebrate that. Anybody else? Okay, well, for all the things that you're too shy to share, we're going to celebrate and bless you, and for those at home too, uh, while we play this song and sing the words in your hearts, God grant you many years. I do have a few announcements this morning so that you can be a part of this community in some other ways other than worship. You're invited to come to participate in three upcoming events discussing whether Hennepin clergy will be able to do um, weddings here, same-sex marriage, in our premises. We call that marriage equality in other places and also here. The first session will take place today after worship at 1130 on Zoom. These important conversations on inclusion are an opportunity to listen, to learn, and to ask questions and raise many concerns that you might have uh, as we prepare for a congregational wide vote on October 3rd. There will be two more sessions after that. There's information on the website, so go there if you'd like, and you can check it out and the Zoom link is there as well. Heather Alden and Rick Belbatoski, our Director of Youth and Young Adult Ministries, are returning to Facebook Live this Wednesday at 7 p.m. for another Hot Topics conversation. This week they're chatting about returning to school and what it means for our children and family in light of COVID-19. We know there's a lot of stress and a lot of worry about that. So for more information, check out our youth webpage at haumc.org and slash youth. The Sacred Journey community, as I said, is in a time of discernment, and we want to hear how you're feeling and your thoughts and what you like and what you don't like. We're going to have a listening and healing circle. Join us Thursday on August 26th. That's this coming Thursday at 7 p.m., and this one will be on Zoom. Last week was on in person. This week is on Zoom, and the link's on the events page on our website. We're glad that Pastor Laura Hannah is going to be joining us, and she has a little greeting that she has provided for us. So let's show that video now. Hi, everyone. My name is Pastor Laura Hannah, and I am so pleased to be joining the team at Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church as your new associate pastor. And it's been so nice to get to know your church and what you are all are passionate about. But it's just uh, fair enough to give you a little info about myself. My husband, Andrew, and I, we met at the Woodbury YMCA, and we celebrated six years of marriage this past July. We have two kids, Montrell, who goes by Trell, and Ryla, and two dogs named Maya and Shirley. Uh, my husband, Andrew, actually serves as the executive director of the downtown Minneapolis YMCA, and so I'm so blessed to be serving with him in the same community. So. I look forward to joining you all as of September 1st, and just know that in the meantime that I am praying for you all and for this next chapter in the life of the Methodist Church of Henman Avenue. See you all soon, and feel free to reach out and so that we can get to know each other a little bit more. excited for Hannah, for Laura Hannah to come and join us. And I know you'll want to be here on September 12th when we have an official welcome. It's also kickoff Sunday, so I hope you'll put that, save the date on your calendar so that you can be here in person or online, and we will welcome uh, Laura Hannah officially to our ministry.
I want to, you know, to know is when we ever welcome a new pastor, we have to have a charge conference to approve the clergy compensation. That will be next Sunday on the 29th, immediately following the second service, our traditional service. It will be at 11.30 on Zoom and also in person. We will set our compensation. I want to also to know our adult nurture team knows that we have been suffering a lot of loss in these last year and a half as we have had to deal with COVID. And we know that a lot of people have had a lost lo loved ones and have lost their jobs and there's just so much loss. So they have asked if we could have a 7 o'clock on Zoom, uh, a time of a lament. And so um, that will be next Sunday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. I hope you'll join us. It's very short, about 15 minutes, and then there'll be time um, for, for conversation after that. So mark your calendars. The links for that will also be on our website. It is good to sing. We can sing uh, t in person today, but sing along on our next song, Listen, God is Calling. Here's the song from Tanzania. Please sing along. Listen, listen, God is calling Through the word inviting Offering forgiveness Comfort and joy Listen, listen, God is calling Gave this mandate, share the good news that he came to save us and set us free. Listen, listen, God is calling to the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Listen, listen, God is calling. Forgotten throughout the world, take care of each other, go heal the hurt. Listen, listen, God is calling through the word, inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Neno, neno, la que mungu, la cuite wewe, neno, la wokovu. He can even speak Swahili. How about that? <laughs> Want to thank Daryl and Stephen for leading us in music this morning. Want to thank Stefan for um, telling the story this morning and sharing their heart. And I thank all of you for being present today so that we might share in this community together. Will you rise now as we bless one another? Ah, men. Ah, women. Ah, children. Ah, animals. Ah, creation. Ah. Know that God goes with you wherever God has called you to go this week. Go with joy and with hope, knowing that God is with you always. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.